fucking good. All you'll ever be. It's difficult to overstate just how much Star Wars changed the landscape of cinema in the late 1970s. After its meteoric success, every major Hollywood studio began pushing for more high-budget sci-fi and fantasy projects on the big and small screens, and the deluge of Star Wars-inspired films is too great to fully detail here. As the 80s dawned and with the enthusiastic help of both George Lucas and Steven Spielberg, Science fiction achieved a renaissance in cinema, but for every massive blockbuster success story, there were dozens if not hundreds of box office disappointments. Nevertheless, those of us who grew up in the 80s and were fans of the genre had a veritable buffet of options, and even some of the biggest bombs are held in a warm place in our hearts. On the distant world of Krull, an alien being called the Beast has come with his army of inhuman slayers to take over the planet and exhaust its natural resources. Setting aside their generational squabbles, two kingdoms unite to take on the Beast, but as Prince Colwyn and Princess Lyssa wed in preparation to rule, the slayers mount a devastating attack, kidnap the princess, and leave Colwyn for dead. Colwyn awakens as the new king of a ruined land, and he must forge an alliance with bandits, seers, a conjurer, and a cyclops to take the battle to the beast's black fortress, where his new wife, his new queen, waits in the conqueror's brutal clutches. In 1980, Columbia Pictures went to producer Ron Silverman with the suggestion to do a sword and sorcery style fantasy adventure film. Silverman, with the help of theater chain owner Ted Mann, then hired Stanford Sherman, writer of Any Which Way You Can, to come up with a story idea. What Sherman and Silverman then pitched to Columbia was given the go-ahead to be turned into a full script by Sherman, which he titled The Dragons of Krull. This script was for a straight fantasy film, but after the box office disaster that was 1981's Dragon Slayer, the project morphed into something with more science fiction elements and with the titular dragons taken out. Indeed, the script was constantly being tweaked all the way through production, with Columbia and the filmmakers hoping to distance themselves from the sword and sorcery label they had already given the film. To direct the piece, Silverman hired Peter Yates, the versatile director of Bullet, The Deep, and Breaking Away. Yates was brought on board when the project was still the Dragons of Krull, but he became even more excited when he was given the freedom to go in a more imaginative direction. He was interested in learning more about big-budget special effects, but he wanted most of all to focus on the characters, to turn the film into something that would be fun for kids and engaging for adults. In the early stages of development, Krull was intended to take advantage of the medieval castles and landscapes of Great Britain, but after the push towards sci-fi, Yates decided to focus more heavily on sound stages, where the designers would have the ability to create exotic alien locales and unconventional architecture. However, he still wanted to stay in England, his home turf, and so the production was moved to Pinewood Studios in London with an almost entirely British cast and crew. The only American cast member is theater actor Ken Marshall who Columbia wanted in the lead role due to his strong performance in the epic 1982 miniseries Marco Polo. Though Marshall's character in Krull had been written to be much younger, Columbia wanted an older performer for the part, mostly to avoid comparisons to Dragon Slayer and Star Wars. Marshall, a Juilliard graduate and trained fencer, loved the swashbuckling nature of the script and played the part of Colwyn much like Errol Flynn. He did extensive physical training for months prior to filming, and he insisted on doing all but the most dangerous stunts himself. Unfortunately, Krull didn't launch a strong film career for the actor, though he did continue to work in television, even landing a memorable recurring guest role in Star Trek Deep Space Nine. A Captain, it's come to our attention that there may be a Maquis smuggler here on the station. The female lead, the Princess-slash-Queen Lyssa, is played by a 17-year-old Lizette Antony, fresh out of school. 
Even though they approved of the casting, the producers felt that Antony's voice wasn't mature enough, so they had her dialogue dubbed over by the American actress Lindsay Krauss. In hindsight, I think this is one of the filmmakers' biggest mistakes, because Krauss's voice just doesn't match Antony's performance. Not here, Goldwyn. He's too powerful. You must fight him away from the center. The rest of the cast consists of established British performers like Freddie Jones as Yanir and David Batley as Ergo the Magnificent. Short in stature, tall in power, narrow of purpose, and wide of vision. As well as many future stars like Alan Armstrong, Robbie Coltrane, and Liam Neeson as three of the bandits who join up with Colwyn early in the film. Robbie Coltrane's character didn't initially have any dialogue, but as a condition of taking the role, he managed to coax a promise out of Peter Yates that he'd speak a few lines throughout the film. Well, can't a man even talk to himself without being interrupted? Other actors worth noting include the six foot seven Bernard Breslau as Rel and Francesca Annis as the widow of the web. Most of the smaller parts were given to Shakespearean theater actors, as Yates was keen to give the film an exaggerated theatrical flair. Filming began in January of 1982. Though some location shooting took place in the Cortina and Abruzzo regions of Italy, most of the film was shot on sound stages at Pinewood, including at the enormous 4,220 square meter 007 stage. The expansive and realistic sets are definitely one of the movie's highlights, and until I started my research, I had no idea how much of the film was done indoors, including most of the forest scenes and that massive battle sequence near the start of the film, complete with pyrotechnics, smoke, and even horses that had to be brought in by crane. Production designer Stephen Grimes was responsible for creating the look of Krull, under an operating philosophy of familiar but different. Medieval weapons were reworked to look unique, such as the Cyclops' trident, and the castle at the start of the film was deliberately given a look that melded classical architecture with futuristic angles and modern sensibilities. The Black Fortress was partially inspired by Uluru in Australia, and was built in carefully designed interlocking pieces so that it could be destroyed and rebuilt multiple times. The iconic glaive, which, strictly speaking, has very little to do with real-life glaives, presented a few problems. In order to get the blades to pop out in unison like switchblades, multiple complicated setups were attempted, such as pumping compressed air through a hose in Ken Marshall's arm, until the decidedly low-tech solution of rubber bands proved to be both effective and reliable. Another difficulty was the need for Ken to catch it out of the air after throwing it, which was ultimately achieved by filming in reverse. The actor Bernard Breslau had his Cyclops makeup applied surprisingly quickly every day, with the eye operated by remote, and the wrinkles doubling as hidden slits through which the actor could see. For the memorable spider sequence, they brought in stop-motion animator Stephen Archer, who had apprenticed under Ray Harryhausen during the production of Clash of the Titans, while other visual and special effects were overseen by Derek Meddings, who had previously worked on Superman and several James Bond films. In scenes that required actors to be startled, the director, Peter Yates, fired a prop gun off-camera, often to ensure that multiple actors would react simultaneously. For the fire mayors, they had to specially train 16 Clydesdales, which aren't usually used for writing anymore, and a special treadmill that was built for them to gallop on for blue screen sequences. Reportedly, the horses were easier to train than the actors who had to learn how to ride them. The music was composed by a young James Horner, whose career had just started with Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan and memorable Star Wars knockoff Battle Beyond the Stars. Though it is often extremely overdone, the score is certainly memorable and lends the film an air of grandiose adventure, even if it occasionally sounds a little too much like Star Trek II. One thing's for sure, Horner earns his surname on this picture. While we're stopped, I just want to quickly remind you to hit that like button, and if you really do like this video, hit that subscribe as well. 
Your support really makes this channel possible, so please, if you like what I'm doing and you want to see more, consider joining my Patreon to get access to bonus content, vote on future topics, and more. If you want to see even more from me, I'm also the co-host of a couple of different podcasts, The Streaming Heap and From Here to Paternity, which are available wherever you get your podcasts, and I have a novel called Paradox that is available through Amazon. If all else fails, though, you can always check out my website at emcgill.com, where you'll find written reviews of plenty more sci-fi classics in both film and literature. Now then, with all that shameless self-promotion out of the way, let's move on. Krull released in July of 1983, to poor reviews and a dismal $16.9 million gross at the US box office, against a budget of somewhere between $27 and $30 million. Though less successful than such counterparts as The Dark Crystal and The NeverEnding Story, Krull did well enough on home video to gain a cult following that persists to this day. Unfortunately, its most lasting legacy, alongside many other early 80s fantasy flops like Ridley Scott's Legend, was to keep pure fantasy from reaching the same heights as science fiction until Peter Jackson came along in 2001. As for me, I grew up on this movie and have always loved it. As an adult, I can definitely see its flaws, but I still marvel at the creativity on display in the sets, the designs, and the effects work. Though I must confess the climax is a hot mess, and the beast, though very cool in its Giger-esque design, looks terrible. I do like the surreal imagery of the fortress interior, and I absolutely love the entire Widow of the Web sequence, which on its own makes the movie worth watching. Most of all, I appreciate how much the film tries to visually distinguish itself from a run-of-the-mill sword and sorcery fantasy film. However, the writing really lets the whole thing down. I'm surprised by how much Yates goes on in interviews about how he wanted to make a character piece, because the character arcs are half-baked at best, with Colwyn's development as protagonist sorely lacking. He is driven not by a desire to save the world or be a good king or anything like that, but simply to save the damsel in distress, and he never wavers or is properly challenged by events. There are some memorable character moments, again I point to the Widow of the Web scene, I know you can never forgive me. I cannot forgive myself, I have already forgiven you. But for the most part, it feels like most characters go through the motions of change without ever actually changing. We never see, for example, how or why Ergo overcomes his fear of Rel, or why Robbie Coltrane's character comes to believe that he was wrong about Colwyn. I'm also not sold on the theatrical style of acting, which comes across as unnecessarily cheesy. Worse than that, though, is the storytelling, where obstacles are so contrived they become self-satire by the end, with random, previously unknown rules dropped in the middle of scenes right before they become important for the plot. The only future they are permitted to see is the time of their own death. He must stay here and accept his fate. If he opposes it, he'll bring great pain on himself. It can be turned only once. That is the lure of the web. We must get inside before the twin suns rise. Ha! There's also very little in the way of thematic depth to analyze. Krull is a mishmash of sci-fi fantasy tropes, combining equal parts Flash Gordon, King Arthur, and Lord of the Rings, but without achieving the same heights. Sure, as a family film, you can pry some simple universal values from it, and there's nothing particularly wrong with aiming to just entertain audiences, but there's not much more to it. I don't want to leave you with the impression that there's nothing of value to crawl, though. It is an enjoyable fantasy film that should be applauded for its raw ambition. Despite telling a derivative story, the movie manages to be experimental and unique in what it's trying to do as a film. I still love it, despite its flaws, and in my mind, that's the only true criteria necessary to consider it a sci-fi classic. And that's all for today, my fellow Earthlings. What's your favorite 80s fantasy film? Let me know in the comments, and while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. Thank you for watching, and until next time, when H.G. Wells will show us what to expect, this is The Unapologetic Geek, telling you to never be ashamed of what you love. As long as you're not hurting anybody.
share and share alike.